Chapter Nine of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reveals a mysterious business. In the few days which followed, Lady Hayburn's attitude towards Gabrielle became one of marked affection. She even kissed her in the breakfast room each morning, called her dear, and consulted her upon the day's arrangements. Poor Sir Henry was but a cipher in the household. He usually took all his meals alone, except dinner, and was very seldom seen, save perhaps when he came out for an hour or so to walk in the park, led by his daughter, or else alone, tapping before him with his stout stick. On such occasions, he would wear a pair of big blue spectacles to hide the unsightliness of his gray, filmy eyes. Sometimes he would sit on one of the garden seats on the south side of the house, enjoying the sunshine and listening to the songs of the birds, the hum of the insects, and the soft ripples of the burn far below. And on such occasions one of his wife's guests would join him to chat and cheer him, for everyone felt pity for the lonely man living his life of darkness. No one was more full of words of sympathy than James Flockhart. Gabrielle longed to warn her father of that man, but dared not do so. There was a reason, a strong reason, for her silence. Sir Henry had declared that he was interested in the man's intellectual conversation, and that he rather liked him, though he had never looked upon his face. In some things the old gentleman was ever ready to adopt his daughter's advice and rely upon her judgment. But in others he was quite obstinate and treated her pointed remarks with calm indifference. One day, at Lady Hayburn's suggestion, Gabrielle, accompanied by Flockhart and another of the guests, a retired colonel, had driven over in the big car to Perth to make a call. And on their return she spent some hours in the library with her father, attending to his correspondence. That morning a big packet of those typed reports in French had arrived, in the usual registered orange-colored envelope, and after she had read them over to the baronet, he had given her the key, and she had got out the code-book. Then, at his instructions, she had written upon a yellow telegraph form a cipher message, addressed to the mysterious Metforeau, Paris. It read when decoded. Arrange with Amethyst. I agree the price of pearls. Have no fear of Smithson, but watch Peters. If London refuses, then Mayfair. Expect report of Bedford. It was not signed by the baronet's name, but by the signature he always used on such telegraphic replies, Senrab. From such a dispatch, she could gather nothing. At his request, she took away the little blue-covered book and relocked it in the safe. Then she rang for Hill and told him to send the dispatch by messenger down to Octeradar Village. Very well, miss, replied the man, bowing. The car is going down to take Mr. Seymour to the station in about a quarter of an hour. So Stokes will take it. And look here, exclaimed the blind man, who was standing before the window with his back to the crimson sunset. You can tell her ladyship hill that I'm very busy and I shan't come in to dinner tonight. Just serve a snack here for me, will you? Very well, Sir Henry, responded the smart footman, and bowing again, he closed the door. May I dine with you, Dad? asked the girl. There are two or three people invited tonight, and they don't interest me in the least. My dear child, what do you mean? Why aren't Walter Murray and his mother dining here tonight? I know your mother invited them ten days ago. Oh, why, yes, replied the girl rather lamely. I did not recollect. Then, I suppose, I must put in an appearance, she sighed. Suppose, he echoed. What would Walter think if you elected to dine with me instead of meeting him at table? Now, Dad, it is really unkind of you, she said reprovingly. Walter and I thoroughly understand each other. He's not surprised at anything I do. Ah, laughed the sightless man. He's already beginning to understand the feminine perverseness, eh? Well, my child, dine here with me if you wish. By all means. Tell Hill to lay the table for two. We have lots of work to do afterwards. So the bell was rung again, and Hill was informed that Miss Gabrielle would dine with her father in the library. Then they turned again to the baronet's mysterious private affairs. 
and when she had seated herself at the typewriter and re-read the reports confidential reports they were but framed in a manner which only the old man himself could understand he dictated to her cryptic replies the true nature of which were to her a mystery the last of the reports brief and unsigned read as follows mon petit garçon est très gravement malade et je supplie de et je n'y de ne pas me punir si sévèrement de ne pas me prendre mon enfant depuis la dernière bulletin du professeur nieberger il est la fèvre scarletine et l'issue de la maladie est incertaine je ne quitte plus sans chevet et sans cesse je me dis c'est une punition du ciel gabrielle saw that to the outside world it was a statement by a frantic mother that her child had caught scarlet fever what could it really mean she wondered slowly she read it and as she did so noticed the curious effect it had upon her father seated as he was in the deep saddlebag chair his face grew very grave his thin white hands clenched themselves and there was an unusually bitter expression about his mouth eh he asked as though not quite certain of the words read it again child slower i i have to think she obeyed wondering if the key to the cryptic message were contained in some conjunction of letters or words it seemed as though in imagination he was setting it down before him as she pronounced the words this was often so at times he would have reports repeated to him over and over again ah he gasped at last drawing a long breath his hands still tightly clenched his countenance haggard and drawn i i expected that and so it has come at last what dad asked the girl in surprise staring at the crisp typewritten sheet before her oh well nothing child nothing he answered bestirring himself but the lady whoever she is seems terribly concerned about her little boy the judgment of heaven she calls it and well she may gabrielle he answered in a hoarse strange voice well she may my dear it is a punishment set upon the wicked is the mother wicked then asked the girl in curiosity no dear he urged don't try to understand for you can never do that these reports convey to me alone the truth they are intended to mislead you as they mislead other people then there is no little boy suffering from scarlet fever yes because it is written there was his smiling reply but it only refers to an imaginary child and by doing so places a surprising and alarming truth before me is the matter so very serious dad she asked noticing the curious effect the words had had upon him serious he echoed leaning forward in his chair yes he answered in a low voice it is very serious child both to me and to you i don't understand you dad she exclaimed walking to his chair throwing herself upon her knees and placing her arms around his neck won't you be more explicit won't you tell me the truth surely you can rely upon my secrecy yes child he said groping until his hand fell upon her hair and then stroking it tenderly i trust you you keep my affairs from those people who seek to obtain knowledge of them without you i would be compelled to employ a secretary but he could be bought without a doubt most secretaries can ford was very trustworthy was he not yes poor ford he sighed when he died i lost my right hand but fortunately you were old enough to take his place but in a case like this when you are worried and excited as you are at this moment why not confide in me and allow me to help you she suggested you see that although i act as your secretary dad I know nothing of the nature of your business and forgive me for speaking very plainly child i do not intend that you should the old man said because you cannot trust me she pouted you think that because i am a woman i cannot keep a secret not at all he said i place every confidence in you dear you are the only real friend left to me in the whole world i know that you would never willingly betray me to my enemies but well but what but you might do so unknowingly you might by one single chance word place me within the power of those who seek my downfall who seeks your downfall dad she asked very seriously 
that's a matter which i desire to keep to myself unfortunately I, I do not know the identity of my enemies hence i am compelled to keep from you certain matters which in other circumstances you might know but he added this is not the first time we've discussed this question gabrielle dear you are my daughter and i trust you do not child misjudge me by suspecting that i doubt your loyalty i don't dad only sometimes i sometimes you think he said still stroking her hair you think that i ought to tell you the reason i receive all these reports from paris and their real significance well to tell the truth dear it is best that you should not know if you reflect for a moment went on the old man tears welling slowly in his filmy sightless eyes you will realize my unhappy situation how i am compelled to hide my affairs even from lady Hayburn herself does she ever question you regarding them she used to at one time but she refrains nowadays for i would tell her nothing has anyone else ever tried to glean information from you he inquired after a long breath mr flockhart has done so on several occasions of late but i pleaded absolute ignorance oh flockhart has been asking you has he remarked her father with surprise well i suppose it is only natural a blind man's doings are always more or less a mystery to the world i don't like mr flockhart dad she said so you've remarked before my dear her father replied of course you are right in withholding any information upon a subject which is my own affair yet on the other hand you should always remember that he is your mother's very good friend and yours also mine gasped the girl starting up would that she were free to tell the poor blind helpless man the ghastly truth my friend dad what makes you think that because he is always singing your praises both to me and your mother then i tell you that his expressions of opinion are false dear dad how she was silent she dared not tell her father the reason therefore in order to turn the subject she replied with a forced laugh oh well of course i may be mistaken but that's my opinion a mere prejudice child i'm sure it is as far as i know flockhart is quite an excellent fellow and is most kind both to your mother and to myself gabrielle's brow contracted disengaging herself she rose to her feet and after a pause asked what reply shall i send to the report dad ah that report gasped the man huddled up in his chair in serious reflection that report he repeated rising to straighten himself reply in these words no effort is to be made to save the child's life on the contrary it is to be so neglected as to produce a fatal termination the girl had seated herself at the typewriter and rapidly clicked out the words in french words that seemed ominous enough and yet the true meaning of which she never dreamed she was thinking only of her father's misplaced friendship in james flockhart if she dared to tell him the naked truth oh if her poor blind afflicted father could only see End of chapter nine chapter ten of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain declares a woman's love at nine o'clock that night gabrielle left her father and ascended to her own pretty room with its light chintz covered furniture its well-filled bamboo bookcases its little writing table and its narrow bed in the alcove it was a nest of rest and cosy comfort exchanging her tweed dress she put on an easy dressing gown of pale blue cashmere drew up an armchair and arranging her electric reading lamp sat down to a new novel she intended to finish presently elise came to her but looking up she said she did not wish to be disturbed and again coiled herself up in the chair endeavoring to concentrate her thoughts upon her book but all to no purpose ever and anon she would lift her big eyes from the printed page sigh and stare fixedly at the rose-colored treadless pattern of the wallpaper opposite upon her there had fallen a feeling of vague apprehension as she had never before experienced a feeling that something was about to happen lady Hayburn was she knew greatly annoyed that she had not made her appearance at dinner or in the drawing-room afterwards 
generally when there were guests from the neighborhood she was compelled to sing one or other of her italian songs her refusal to come to dinner would she knew cause her ladyship much chagrin for it showed plainly to the guest that her authority over her stepdaughter was entirely at an end just as the stable clock chimed half past ten there came a light tap at the door it was hill who on receiving permission to enter said if you please miss mr murray has just asked me to give you this and he handed her an envelope tearing it open eagerly she found a visiting card upon which some words were scribbled in pencil for a moment after reading them she paused then she said tell mr murray it will be all right very well miss the man replied and bowing closed the door for a few moments she stood motionless in the centre of the room her lover's card still in her hand then she walked to the open window and looked out into the hot oppressive night the moon was hidden behind dark clouds and the stillness was precursory of the thunderstorm which for the past hour or so had threatened across the room she paced slowly several times a deep anxious expression upon her pale countenance then slowly she slipped off her gown and put on a dark stuff dress until the clock had struck eleven she waited then assuming her tam o' shanter and twisting a silk scarf about her neck she crept along the corridor and down the wide oak stairs lights were still burning but without detection she slipped out by the main door and crossing the broad drive took the winding path into the woods the guests had all left and the servants were closing the house for the night scarce had she gone a hundred yards when a dark figure in overcoat and a golf cap loomed up before her and she found walter at her side why dearest he exclaimed taking her hand and bending till he pressed it to his lips i began to fear you wouldn't come why haven't i seen you to-night because well because i had a bad headache was her lame reply i knew that if i went in to dinner mother would want me to sing and i really didn't feel up to it i hope however you haven't been bored too much you know i have he said quickly in a low earnest voice i came here purposely to see you and you were invisible i've run the car down the farm road on the other side of the park and left it there the mater went home in the carriage nearly an hour ago she's afraid to go in the car when i drive slowly they strolled together along the dark path he with her arm held tenderly under his own think darling he said i haven't seen you for four whole days why is it yesterday i went to the usual spot at the end of the glen and waited nearly two hours but you did not come although you promised me you know why are you so indifferent dearest he asked in a plaintive tone i can't really make you out of late i'm not indifferent at all walter she declared my father has very much to attend to just now and i'm compelled to assist him as you are well aware he's so utterly helpless oh but you might spare me just half an hour sometimes he said in a light tone of reproach i do why we surely see each other very often not often enough for me gabrielle he declared halting in the darkness and raising his, her soft little hand to his eager lips you know well enough how fondly i love you how i know she said in a sad blank tone her own heart beat fast at his passionate words then why do you treat me like this he asked is it because i have annoyed you that you perhaps think i am not keeping faith with you i know i was absent a long time but it was really not my own fault my people made me go round the world i didn't want to i assure you i'd far rather have been up here at conican all the time and near you my own well-beloved i believe you would walter she answered turning towards him with her hand upon his shoulder but i do wish you wouldn't reproach me for my undemonstrativeness each time we meet it saddens me i know i ought not to reproach you he hastened to assure her i have no right to do so but somehow you have of late grown so sphinx-like that you are not the gabrielle i used to know why not and she laughed a strange hollow laugh explain yourself in the days gone by before i went abroad you were not so particular about our meetings being clandestine you did not care who saw us or what people might say i was a girl then i have now learnt wisdom and the truth of the modern religion 
which holds that the only sin is that of being found out but why are you so secret in all your actions he demanded whom do you fear fear she echoed starting and staring in his direction why i fear nobody what what makes you think that because it has lately struck me that you met me in secret because well because you are afraid of some one or do not wish us to be seen why how very foolish she laughed don't my father and mother both know that we love each other besides i am surely my own mistress i would never marry a man i don't love she added in a tone of quiet defiance and am i to take it that you really do love me after all he inquired very earnestly why of course she replied without hesitation again placing her arm about his neck and kissing him how foolish of you to ask such a question walter when will you be convinced that the answer i gave you long ago was the actual truth men who love as fervently as i do are apt to be somewhat foolish she declared then don't be foolish any longer she urged in a matter-of-fact voice lifting her lips to his and kissing him you know i love you walter therefore you should also know that if i avoid you in public i have some good reason for doing so a reason he cried what reason tell me she shook her head that is my own affair she responded i repeat again that my affection for you is undiminished if such repetition really pleases you as it seems to do of course it pleases me dearest he declared no words are sweeter to my ears than the declaration of your love my only regret is that now i am at home again i do not see so much of you sweetheart as i had anticipated walter she exclaimed in a slow changed voice after a brief silence there is a reason please do not ask me to tell you because well because i can't and drawing a long breath she added all i beg of you is to remain patient and trust in me i love you and i love no other man surely that should be for you all sufficient i am yours and yours only in an instant he had folded her slight dainty form in his arms the young man was satisfied perfectly satisfied they strolled on together through the wood and out across the open cornfields the moon had come forth again the storm clouds had passed and the night was perfect though she was trying against her will to hold aloof from walter murray yet she loved him with all her heart and soul many letters she had addressed to him in his travels had remained unanswered this had in a measure piqued her but she was in ignorance that much of his correspondence and hers had fallen into the hands of her ladyship and been destroyed as they walked on talking as lovers will she was thinking deeply and full of regret that she dared not tell the truth to this man who loving her so fondly would she knew be prepared to make any sacrifice for her sake suppose he knew the truth whatever sacrifice he made would alas not alter facts if she confessed he would only hate her ah the tragedy of it all therefore she held her silence she dared not speak lest she might lose his love she had no friend in whom she could confide from her own father even she was compelled to hide the actual facts they were too terrible what would he think if the bitter truth were exposed the man at her side tall brave strong a lover whom she knew many girls coveted believed that he was to marry her but she told herself within her grief-stricken heart such a thing could never be a barrier stood between them invisible yet nevertheless one that might for ever debar their mutual happiness an involuntary sigh escaped her and he inquired the reason she excused herself by saying that it was owing to the exertion of walking over the rough path therefore they halted and with the bright summer moonbeams falling upon her beautiful countenance he kissed her passionately upon the lips again and yet again they remained together for over an hour moving along slowly heedless of where their footsteps led them heedless too of being seen by any of the keepers who at night usually patrolled the estate their walk however lay at the farther end of the glen in the coverts remote from the house and near the high road therefore there was but little danger of being observed many were the pledges of affection they exchanged before parting on walter's part they were fervent and passionate but on the part of his idol 
they were alas only the pretense of a happiness which she feared could never be permanent presently they retraced their steps to the edge of the wood beyond which lay the house they found the path and there at her request he left her it was not wise that he should approach the house at that hour she urged so after a long and fervent leave-taking he held her in a last embrace and then raising his cap and saying good night my darling my own well-beloved he turned away and went at a swinging pace down the farm road where he had left his car with lights extinguished she watched him disappear then sighing she turned into the dark winding path beneath the trees the end of which came out upon the drive close to the house halfway down however with sudden resolve she took a narrower path to the left and was soon on the outskirts of the wood but and out again in the bright moonlight the night was so glorious that she had resolved to stroll alone to think and devise some plan for the future before her silhouetted high against the steely sky rose the two great black ivy-clad towers of the ancient castle the grim crumbling wall stood dark and frowning amid the fairy-like scene while from far below came up the faint rippling of the ruthven water a great owl flapped lazily from the ivy as she approached those historic old walls which in bygone days had held within them some of scotland's greatest men she had explored and knew every nook and cranny in these extensive ruins with walter's assistance she had once made a perilous ascent to the top of the highest of the two square towers and had often clambered along the broken walls of the keep or descended into those strange little subterranean chambers now half choked with earth and rubbish which tradition had declared were the dungeons in which prisoners in the old days had been put to the rack seared with red-hot irons or submitted to other horrible tortures her feet falling noiselessly she entered the grass-grown courtyard where stood the ancient spreading yew the dual tree under which the glencardine charters had been signed and justice administered other big trees had sprung from seedlings since the place had fallen into ruin and having entered she paused amidst its weird impressive silence those high ponderous walls about her spoke mutely of strength and impregnability those grass-grown mounds hid ruined walls and broken foundations what tales of wild lawlessness and reckless bloodshed they all could tell many of the strange stories she had heard in concerning the old place stories told her by the people in the neighborhood were recalled as she stood there gazing wonderingly about her many romantic legends had indeed been handed down in perthshire from generation to generation concerning old glencardine and its lawless masters and for her they had always possessed a strange fascination for had she not inherited the antiquarian tastes of her father and had she not read many works upon folklore and such like subjects suddenly while standing in the deep shadow gazing thoughtfully up at those high towers which though ruined still guarded the end of the glen a strange thing occurred something which startled her causing her to halt breathless petrified rooted to the spot she stared straight before her something uncanny was happening there something that was indeed beyond human credence and quite inexplicable end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain concerns the whispers what had startled gabrielle was certainly extraordinary and decidedly uncanny she was standing near the southern wall when of a sudden she heard low but distinct whispers again she listened yes the sounds were not due to her excited imagination at the recollection of those romantic traditions of love and hatred or of those gruesome stories how the wolf of badenoch had been kept prisoner there for five years and put to frightful tortures or how the laird of weem was deliberately poisoned in that old banqueting hall the huge open fireplace of which still existed near where she stood there was the distinct sound of low whispered words she held her breath to listen she tried to distinguish what the words were but in vain then she endeavored to determine whence they emanated but was unable to do so again they sounded 
again and yet again then there was another voice still low still whispering but not quite so deep as the first it sounded like a woman's local tradition had it that the place held the ghosts of those who had died in agony within its noisome dungeons but she had always been far too matter-of-fact to accept stories of the supernatural yet at that moment her ears did not deceive her that pile of grim gaunt ruins was a house of whispers again she listened never moving a muscle an owl hooted weirdly in the ivy far above her while near at her feet a rabbit scuttled away through the grass such noises she was used to she knew every night sound of the countryside for when she had finished her work in the library she often went unknown to the household with stuart upon his nocturnal rounds and walked miles through the woods in the night the grey-eyed thin-nosed headkeeper was her particular favorite he knew so much of natural history and he taught her all he knew she could distinguish the cries of birds in the night and could tell by certain sounds made by them as they were disturbed that no other intruders were in the vicinity but that weird whispering coming as it did from an undiscovered source was inhumane and utterly uncanny was it possible that her ears had deceived her was it one of the omens believed in by the superstitious the wall whence the voices appeared to emanate was she knew about seven feet thick an outer wall of the old keep she was aware of this because in one of the folio tomes in the library was a picture of the castle as it appeared in fifteen ten taken from some manuscript of that period preserved in the british museum she who had explored the ruins dozens of times knew well that at the point where she was standing there could be no place of concealment beyond that wall the hill covered with bushes and brushwood descended sheer for three hundred feet or so to the bottom of the glen had the voices sounded from one or other of the half-choked chambers which remained more or less intact she would not have been so puzzled but as it was the weird whisperings seemed to come forth from space sometimes they sounded so low that she could scarcely hear them at others they were so loud that she could almost distinguish the words uttered by the unseen was it merely a phenomenon caused by the wind blowing through some crack in the ponderous lichen covered wall she looked beyond at the great dark yew the justice tree of the grahams the night was perfectly calm not a leaf stirred either upon that or upon the other trees the ivy high above and exposed to the slightest breath of a breeze was motionless only the going and coming of the night birds moved it no she decided once and for all that the noise was that of voices spectral voices though they might be again she strained her eyes when still again those soft sibilant whisperings sounded weird and quite inexplicable slowly and with greatest caution she moved along beneath the wall but as she did so she seemed to recede from the sound so back she went to the spot where she had previously stood and there again remained listening there were two distinct voices at least that was the conclusion at which she arrived after nearly a quarter of an hour of most minute investigation once she fancied in her excitement that away in the farther corner of the ruined courtyard she saw a slowly moving form like a thin column of mist was it the lady of glencardine the apparition of the hapless lady jane glencardine but on closer inspection she decided that it was merely due to her own distorted imagination and dismissed it from her mind those low curious whisperings alone puzzled her they were certainly not sounds that could be made by any rodents within the walls because they were voices distinctly and indisputably voices which at some moments were raised in argument and then fell away into sounds of indistinct murmuring whence did they come she again moved noiselessly from place to place at length deciding that only at one point the point where she had first stood could the sounds be heard distinctly so to that spot once more the girl returned standing there like a statue her ears strained for every sound waiting and wondering but the whispers had now ceased in the distance the stable clock chimed two yet she remained at her post determined to solve the mystery 
and not in the least afraid of those weird stories which the country folk in the highlands so entirely believed no ghost of whatever form could frighten her she told herself she had never believed in omens or superstitions and she steeled herself not to believe in them now so she remained there in patience seeking some natural solution of the extraordinary enigma but though she waited until the chimes rang out three o'clock and the moon was going down she heard no other sound the whispers had suddenly ended and the silence of those gaunt frowning old walls was undisturbed a slight wind had now sprung up sweeping across the hills and causing her to feel chill therefore at last she was reluctantly compelled to quit her post of observation and retraced her steps by the rough by-road to the house entering by one of the windows of the morning-room of which the burglar alarm was broken and which on many occasions she had unfastened after her nocturnal rambles with stuart indeed concealed under the walls she kept an old rusted table-knife and by its aid it was her habit to push back the catch and so gain entrance after reconcealing the knife for use on a future occasion on reaching her own room she stood for a few moments reflecting deeply upon her remarkable and inexplicable discovery had the story of those whisperings been told to her she would certainly have scouted them but she had heard them with her own ears and was certain that she had not been deceived it was a mystery absolute and complete and regarding it as such she retired to bed but her thoughts were very naturally full of the weird story told of the dead and gone owners of glencardine she recollected that horrible story of the ghost of manse and of the spectra of bridgend in the library she had a year ago discovered a strange old book one which sixty years before had been in universal circulation entitled satan's invisible world discovered and she had read it from beginning to end this book had perhaps more influence upon the simple-minded country people in scotland than any other work it consisted entirely of relations of ghosts of murdered persons witches warlocks and fairies and it was read as an indoor amusement in the presence of children and followed up by unfounded tales of the same description the youngsters were afraid to turn round in case they might be grasped by the old one so strong indeed became this impression that even grown-up people would not venture through fear into another room or down a stair after nightfall her experience in the old castle had to say the least been remarkable those weird whisperings were extraordinary for hours she lay reflecting upon the many traditions of the old place some recorded in the historic notices of the house of the montrose and others which had gathered from local sources the farmers of the neighborhood the keepers and servants those noises in the night were mysterious and puzzling next morning she went alone to the kennels to find stuart and to question him he had told her many weird stories and traditions of the old place and it struck her that he might be able to furnish her with some information regarding her strange discovery had any one else heard those whispers besides herself she wondered she met several of the guests but assiduously avoided them until at last she saw the thin long-legged keeper going towards his cottage with dash the faithful old spaniel at his heels when she hailed him he touched his cap respectfully changed his gun to the other arm and wished her good morning mees gabrielle in his strong scotch accent she bade him put down his gun and walk with her up the hill towards the ruins look here stuart she commanded in a confidential tone i'm going to take you into my confidence i know i can trust you with a secret ye may miss replied the keen-eyed scot i hope sir enry trust me as a faithful servant i've been on glencar estate for no miss that forty year stuart we all know you are faithful and that you can keep your tongue still what i'm about to tell you is in strictest confidence not even my father knows of it ah then it's a secret in fray the, the laird eh yes she replied i want you to come up to the old castle with me pointing to the great ruined pile standing boldly in the summer sunlight and i want you to tell me all you know i've had a very uncanny experience there what miss exclaimed the man halting and looking her seriously in the face hey you seen the ghost no i haven't seen any ghost replied the girl but last night i heard most extraordinary sounds as though people were within the old walls he'd sake miss and hey ye actually are the, the whispers he gasped 
Then other people have heard them, eh? Inquired the girl quickly. Tell me all you know about the matter, Stuart. Eh? He said, slowly shaking his head. I keen but a wee biddy aboot the noises. Who has heard them besides myself? Maxwell Otilla Chili's girl. She said she heard the whispers. A night, aboot a year seen. They're bad omenies, for the lassie deed sudden a fortnight later. Did anyone else hear them? Old Willie Buchan, who lived down in Oxford Teradar village, declared that at night, while poaching for rabbits, he heard the voices. He tell the doctor, say when he lay in bed a dean, aboot three weeks afterwards. And miss, I'm sorry to say, you've heard the whispers. Then they're regarded as a bad omen to those who overhear them, she remarked. That say, there's been others wha acted as eavesdroppers, and they indeed very soon afterwards. Then there was Jean Kirkwood, and Geordie Mainteeth. The latter was a young keeper. I had here a boot a year seen. He came to me in morning and said that while lying up for poachers that night, before he distinctly heard the whispers, kinning what folks say about overhearing of them being fatal. I launched at him and told him, no, to take only ten o old wives gossy, but miss, sure enough, within a week, he got blood peasonin', and though they took him to the hospital in Perth, he deed. The popular superstition points to the fact that anyone who accidentally acts as an eavesdropper is doomed to death, eh? A very nice outlook for me, she remarked. Ah, oh, Miss Gabrielle, exclaimed the man, greatly concerned, didn't treat the matter lightly. I beg ye, I did be pure me and yeth, and he did, just like the others. But what does it all mean? asked the daughter of the house in a calm, matter-of-fact voice. She knew well that Stuart was just as superstitious as any of his class, for some of the stories he had told her had been most fearful and wonderful elaborations of historical fact. It means, I'm feared, miss he replied, that the whispers which come for nowhere forewarnings o' death. End of chapter 11「Twelve of the House of Whispers」by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Explains some curious facts. Gabrielle was silent for a moment. No doubt Stuart meant what he said. He was not endeavoring to alarm her unduly, but thoroughly believed in supernatural agencies. I suppose you've already examined the ruins thoroughly, eh? she asked at last. Examined them? echoed the gray-bearded man. I should think say. So. After forty old years here. Why, as a laddie, I used to play there ilka day, and have been in ilka neek in cranny. Nevertheless, come up now with me, she said. I want to explain to you exactly where and how I heard the voices. The whispers are an uncanny thing, said the keeper, with his broad accent. I didn't like them, miss. I didn't like to hear what ye tell me ava. Oh, don't worry about me, Stuart, she laughed. I'm not afraid of any omen. I only mean to fathom the mystery, and I want your assistance in doing so. But, of course, you'll say no word to a soul. Remember that. If it be your wish, Miss Gabrielle, I'll say nothing, he promised and together they descended the steep grass slope and overgrown foundations of the castle until they stood in the old courtyard, close to the ancient justice tree, the exact spot where the girl had stood on the previous night. I could hear plainly as I stood just here, she said. The sound of voices seemed to come from that wall there, and she pointed to the gray flint wall, half overgrown with ivy, about six yards away. Stuart made no remark. It was not the first occasion on which he had examined that place in an attempt to solve the mystery of the nocturnal whisperings. He walked across to the wall, tapping it with his hand, while the faithful spaniel began sniffing in expectancy of something to bolt. There's nothing here, miss, absolutely nothing, he declared as they both examined the wall minutely. Its depth did not admit of any chamber, for it was an inner wall, and according to the gamekeeper's statement, he had already tested it years ago, and found it solid masonry. If I went forward or backward, then the sounds were lost to me, Gabrielle explained, much puzzled. Aye, that's just what they have said, remarked the keeper, with an apprehensive look upon his face. The whispers are only hard at a spot. Wherever you've just stood, I've seen the lady and green meself, miss. 
and when i was a laddie and again about ten years seen you mean stuart that you imagine that you saw an apparition you were alone i suppose yes miss i was alone well you thought you saw the lady of glencardine where was she on the drive in front of the house perhaps somebody played a practical joke on you the green lady is glencardine's favorite spectre isn't she perfectly harmless i mean ay miss lots of folks saw her ten years sin but no days she seems to be hay been laid somebody said they saw her last glen's holidays but i didna believe it neither do i stuart but don't let's trouble about the unfortunate lady who ought to have been at rest long ago it's those weird whisperings i mean to investigate and she looked blankly around her at the great cyclopean walls and high weather-beaten towers gaunt yet picturesque in the morning sunshine the keeper shook his shaggy head i'm afeard miss gabrielle that ye'll near stole the mystery there's something you say fatal aboot the vesperings he said speaking his pleasant highland tongue that naebody cares to attempt the investigation they did say that the whispers are the voice of the devil himself the girl in her short blue serge skirt white cotton blouse and blue tam o' shanter laughed at the man's dread there must be a distinct cause for the noise she had heard she argued yet though they both spent half an hour wandering among the ruins standing in the roofless banqueting hall and traversing stone corridors and lichen covered moss-grown ruined chambers choked with weeds their efforts to obtain any clue were all in vain to gabrielle it was quite evident that the old keeper regarded the incident of the previous night as a fatal omen for he was most solicitous of her welfare he went so far as to crave permission to go to sir henry and put the whole of the mysterious facts before him but she would not hear of it she meant to solve the mystery herself if her father learnt of the affair and of the ill omen connected with it the matter would surely cause him great uneasiness why should he be worried on her account no she would never allow it and told stuart plainly of her disapproval of such a course but tell me she asked at last as returning to the courtyard they stood together at the spot where she had stood in that moonlit hour and heard with her own ears those weird mysterious voices coming from nowhere tell me stuart is there any legend connected with the whispers have you ever heard any story concerning their origin of course miss through all Perthshire is weel kint replied the man slowly not it seemed without considerable reluctance what is hard by those doomed to death in the conspiracy of o charles lord laird glencardine and the earl o kintyre for the murder of the infamous cardinal seton o st andrews wha as i dare say ye ken frae history miss was assassinated here on this very spot where we stand the earl of kintyre the gither we laird glencardine his doctor mary in an o the mcintyres of tallentry and we miss o strathbane were a year later tried by a commission issued under the name o mary queen of scots but say popular was the murder of the cardinal that the accused were acquitted yes exclaimed the girl i remember reading something about it in scottish history and the whispers are i suppose said to be ghostly conspirators in conclave that's what folks say miss they deave well as well that old nick himself was present and gied the decision that the cardinal what has to be asked it o'er fair stirling said d it is his evil counsel that is hard by those whom death will quickly overtake really stuart she laughed you make me feel quite uncomfortable but mees sir henry already keens aboot the reespers said the man i heard him telling a young gentleman who came doon last shooting season a gied dale aboot it they visited the old castle together and i happened to be here boots this caused the girl to resolve to learn from her father what she could he was an antiquary and had the history of glencardine at his finger ends so presently she strolled back to stuart's cottage and after receiving from the faithful servant urgent injunctions to have care of herself she walked on to the tennis lawn where shaded by the high trees lady Hayburn in white serge and three of her male guests were playing father she said that same evening when they had settled down to commence work upon those ever arriving documents from paris what was the cause of glencardine becoming a ruin 
while the reason of its downfall was lord glencardine's change of front he answered in sixteen thirty eight he became a stalwart supporter of episcopy and divine right a course which proved equally fatal to himself and to his ancient castle of glencardine reed in his annals of octeradar relates how after the civil war lord dundrennan in company with his cousin george lockin of ochiltree and burgess of octeradar and the laird of Manab descended into strathern and occupied the castle with about fifty men he hurriedly put it into a state of defence general overton besieged the place in person with his army consisting of eighteen hundred foot and eleven hundred horse and battered the walls with cannon having brought a number of great ordnance from stirling castle for ten days the castle was held by the small but resolute garrison and might have held out longer had not the well failed with the prospect of death before them in the event of the place being taken dundrennan and lochan contrived to break through the enemy who surrounded the castle on all sides a page of the name of john hamilton in attendance upon lord dundrennan well acquainted with the localities of glencardine undertook to be their guide when the moon was down dundrennan and lochane issued from the castle by a small postern where they found hamilton waiting for them with three horses they mounted and passing quietly through the enemy's force they escaped and reached lord glencardine in safety to the north on the morning after their escape the castle was surrendered and thirty-five of the garrison were sent to the tolbooth of edinburgh general overton ordered the remaining twelve of those who had surrendered to be shot at a post and the castle to be burned which was accordingly done the country folk in the neighborhood are full of strange stories about ghostly whisperings being heard in the castle ruins she remarked her father started and raising his expressionless face to hers asked in almost a snappish tone well and who has heard them now pray several people i believe and they're gossiping as usual eh he remarked in a hard dry tone up here in the highlands they are ridiculously superstitious who's been telling you about the whispers child oh i've learnt of them from several people she replied evasively mysterious voices were heard they say last night and for several nights previously it's also a local tradition that all those who hear the whispered warning die within forty days bosh my dear utter rubbish the old man laughed who's been trying to frighten you nobody dad i merely tell you what the country people say yes he remarked i know the story is a gruesome one and in the highlands a story is not attractive unless it has some fatality in it up here the belief in demonology and witchcraft has died very hard get down penny's traditions of perth first shelf to the left beyond the second window right hand corner it will explain to you how very superstitious the people have ever been i know all that dad persisted the girl but i'm interested in this extraordinary story of the whispers you as an antiquary have no doubt investigated all the legendary lore connected with glencardine the people declare that the whispers are heard and i am told believe some extraordinary theory regarding them a theory he exclaimed quickly what theory what has been discovered nothing as far as i know no and nothing ever will be discovered he said why not dad she asked do you deny that strange noises are heard there when there is so much evidence in the affirmative i really don't know my dear i've never had the pleasure of hearing them myself though i've been told of them ever since i bought the place but there is a legend which is supposed to account for them is there not dad do tell me what you know she urged i am so very much interested in the old place and its bygone history the less you know concerning the whispers the better my dear he replied abruptly her father's ominous words surprised her did he too believe in the fatal omen though he was trying to mislead her and poke fun at the local superstition but why shouldn't i know she protested this is the first time dad that you've tried to withhold from me any antiquarian knowledge that you possess besides the story of glencardine and its lords is intensely fascinating to me so might be the whispers if you ever had the misfortune to hear them misfortune she gasped turning pale why do you say misfortune but he laughed a strange hollow laugh 
and endeavouring to turn his seriousness into humour said well they might give you a turn perhaps they would make me start i feel sure from what i've been told they seem to come from nowhere it is practically an unseen spectra who has the rather unusual gift of speech it was on the tip of her tongue to explain how on the previous night she had actually listened to the whispers but she refrained she recognized that though he would not admit it he was nevertheless superstitious of ill results following the hearing of those weird whisperings so she made eager pretence of wishing to know the historical facts of the incident referred to by the gamekeeper no exclaimed the blind man softly but firmly taking her hand and stroking her arm tenderly as was his habit when he wished to persuade her no gabrielle dear he said we will change the subject now do not bother your head about absurd country legends of that sort there are so many concerning glencardine and its lords that a whole volume might be filled with them but i want to know all about this particular one dad she said from me you will never know my dear was his answer as his grey serious face was upturned to hers you have never heard the whispers and i sincerely hope that you never will End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain what flockhart foresaw the following afternoon was glaring and breathless gabrielle had taken stokes with may spencer a girlfriend visiting her mother and driven the sixteen over to conican with a message from her mother an invitation to lady murie and her party to luncheon and tennis on the following day it was three o'clock the hour when silence is upon a summer house party in the country beneath the blazing sun glencardine lay amid its rose gardens its cut beech hedges and its bowers of greenery the palpitating heat was terrible the hottest day that summer at the end of the long handsome drawing-room with its pale blue carpet and silk-covered furniture lady heyburn was lolling lazily in her chair near the wide bright steel grate with her inseparable friend james flockhart standing before her the striped blinds outside the three long open windows subdued the sun glare yet the very odour of the cut flowers in the room seemed oppressive while without could be heard the busy hum of insect life the baronet's handsome wife looked cool and comfortable in her gown of white embroidered muslin her head thrown back upon the silken cushion and her eyes raised to those of the man who was idly smoking a cigarette at her side the thing grows more and more inexplicable he was saying to her in a low strained voice all the inquiries i've caused to be made in london and in paris have led to a negative result we shall only know the truth when we get a peep of those papers in henry's safe my dear friend was the woman's reply and that's a pretty difficult job you don't know where the old fellow keeps the key i only wish i did gabrielle knows no doubt then you ought to compel her to divulge he urged once we get hold of that key for half an hour we could learn a lot a lot that would be useful to you eh remarked the woman with a meaning smile and to you also he said couldn't we somehow watch and see where he hides the safe key he never has it upon him you say it isn't on his bunch then he must have a hiding place for it or it may be on his watch chain remarked the man decisively get rid of all the guests as quickly as you can winnie while they're about there's always a danger of eavesdroppers and watchers I've already announced that I'm going up to Inverness next week, so within the next day or two our friends will all leave. Good. Then the ground will be cleared for action, he remarked, blowing a cloud of smoke from his lips. What's your decision regarding the girl? The same as yours. But she hates me, you know, laughed the man in grey flannel. Yes, but she fears you at the same time, and with her you can do more by fear than by love. True but she's got a spirit of her own recollect that must be broken and what about walter oh as soon as he finds out the truth he'll drop her never fear 
he's already rather fond of that tall dark girl of dundas you saw her at the ball you recollect her flockhart grunted he was assisting this woman at his side to play a desperate game this was not however the first occasion on which they had acted in conjunction in matters that were not altogether honourable there had never been any question of affliction between them the pair regarded each other from a purely business standpoint people might gossip as much as ever they liked but the two always congratulated themselves that they had never committed the supreme folly of falling in love with each other the woman had married sir henry merely in order to obtain money and position and this man flockhart who for years had been her most intimate associate had ever remained behind her to advise and to help her perhaps had the baronet not been afflicted he would have disapproved of this constant companionship for he would no doubt have overheard in society certain tittle-tattle which though utterly unfounded would not have been exactly pleasant but as he was blind and never went into society he remained in blissful ignorance wrapped up in his mysterious business and hobbies gabrielle on her return from school had at first accepted flockhart as her friend it was he who took her for walks who taught her to cast a fly to shoot rooks and to play the national winter game of scotland curling he had in the first few months of her return home done everything in his power to attract the young girl's friendship while at the same time her ladyship showed herself extraordinarily well disposed towards her within a year however by reasons of various remarks made by people in her presence and on account of the cold disdain with which lady hayburn treated her afflicted father vague suspicions were aroused within her suspicions which gradually grew to hatred until she clung to her father and as his eyes and ears took up a position of open defiance towards her mother and her adventurous friend the situation each day grew more and more strained lady hayburn was even though of humble origin a woman of unusual intelligence in various quarters she had been snubbed and ridiculed but she gradually managed in every case to get the better of her enemies many a man and many a woman had had bitter cause to repent their enmity towards her they marvelled how their secrets became known to her they did not know the power behind her the sinister power of that ingenious and unscrupulous man james flockhart the man who made it his business to know other people's secrets though for years he had been seized with a desire to get at the bottom of sir henry's private affairs he had never succeeded the old baronet was essentially a recluse he kept himself so much to himself and was so careful that no eyes save those of his daughter should see the mysterious documents which came to him so regularly by registered post that all flockhart's efforts and those of lady hayburn had been futile i had another good look at the safe this morning the man went on presently it is one of the best makes and would resist anything except of course the electric current to force it would be to put henry on his guard lady hayburn remarked if we are to know what secrets are there and use our knowledge for our own benefit we must open it with a key and relock it well winnie we must do something we must both have money that's quite evident he said that last five hundred you gave me will stave off ruin for a week or so but after that we must certainly be well supplied or else there may be revelations well which will be as ugly for yourself as for me i know she exclaimed i fully realize the necessity of getting funds the other affair though we worked it so well proved a miserable fiasco and very nearly gave us away into the bargain he declared i tell you frankly winnie that if we can't pay a level five thousand in three weeks time the truth will be out and you know what that will mean he was watching her handsome face as he spoke and he noticed how pale and drawn were her features as he referred to certain ugly truths that might leak out yes she gasped i know james we'd both find ourselves under arrest such a contretemps is really too terrible to think of but my dear girl it must be faced he said if we don't get the money can't you work sir henry for a bit more say another thousand make an excuse that you have bills to pay in london 
dressmakers jewelers milliners any good story will surely do he gives you anything you ask for she shook her head and sighed i fear i've imposed upon his good nature far too much already she answered i know i'm extravagant i'm sorry but can't help it born in me i suppose a few months ago he found out that i'd been paying Meliche a hundred pounds each time to decorate park street with flowers for my wednesday evenings and he created an awful scene he's getting horribly stingy of late yes but the flowers were a bit expensive weren't they he remarked not at all lady fortrose the wife of the soap man pays two hundred and fifty pounds for flowers for her house every thursday in the season and mine looked quite as good as hers i think Meliche is much cheaper than anybody else and just because i went to a cheap man henry was horrible he said all sorts of weird things about my reckless extravagance and the suffering poor as though i had anything to do with them the genuine poor are really people like you and me i know he said philosophically lighting another cigarette but all this is beside the point we want money and money we must have in order to avoid exposure you i was a fool to have had anything to do with that other little affair she interrupted it was not only myself who arranged it remember it was you who suggested it because it seemed so easy and because you had an old score to pay off the woman was sacrificed and at the same time an enemy learnt our secret i couldn't help it he protested you let your woman's vindictiveness overstep your natural caution my dear girl if you'd taken my advice there would have been no suspicion lady heyburn was silent she sat regarding the toe of her patent leather shoe fixedly in deep reflection she was powerless to protest she was so entirely in this man's hands well she asked at last stirring uneasily in her chair and suppose we are not able to raise the money what do you anticipate will be the result a rapid reprisal was his answer people like them don't hesitate they act yes i see she remarked in a blank voice they have nothing to lose so they will bring pressure upon us just as we once tried to bring pressure upon them it's all a matter of money we pay the price arranged a mere matter of business but how are we to get the money by getting a glance at what's in that safe he replied once we get to know this mysterious secret of sir henry's i and my friends can get money easily enough leave it all to me but how this matter you will please leave entirely to me winnie he repeated with determination we are both in danger great danger and that being so it is incumbent upon me to act boldly and fearlessly i mean to get the key and see what is within that safe but the girl asked her ladyship within one week from to-day the girl will no longer trouble us he said with an evil glance i do not intend that she shall remain a barrier against our good fortune any longer understand that and remain perfectly calm whatever may happen but you surely don't intend you surely will not i shall act as i think proper and without any sentimental advice from you he declared with a mock bow but straightening himself instantly when at the door was heard a fumbling and the grey-bearded man in blue spectacles his thin white hand groping before him slowly entered the room End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain concerns the curse of the cardinal gabrielle and walter were seated together under one of the big oaks at the edge of the tennis lawn at conican with may spencer and lady murray they had been playing but his mother and the young girl had gone into the house for tea leaving the lovers alone what's the matter with you today, darling he had asked as soon as they were out of hearing you don't seem yourself somehow she started quickly and pulling herself up tried to smile assuring him that there was really nothing amiss i do wish you'd tell me what it is that's troubling you so he said ever since i returned from abroad you've not been yourself it's no use denying it you know 
I haven't felt well, perhaps. I think it must be the weather, she assured him. But he, viewing the facts in the light of what he had noticed at their almost daily clandestine meetings, knew that she was concealing something from him. Before his departure on that journey to Japan, she had always been so very frank and open. Nowadays, however, she seemed to have entirely changed. Her love for him was just the same, that he knew. It was her unusual manner, so full of fear and vague apprehension, which caused him so many hours of grave reflection. With her woman's cleverness, she succeeded in changing the topic of conversation, and presently they rose to join his mother at the tea-table in the drawing-room. Half an hour later, while they were idling in the hall together, she suddenly exclaimed, "'Walter, you're great on Scottish history, so I want some information from you. I'm studying the legends and traditions of our place, Glencardine. What do you happen to know about them?' "'Well,' he laughed, "'there are dozens of weird tales about the old castle. I remember reading quite a lot of extraordinary stories in some book or other about three years ago. I found it in the library here. Oh, do tell me about it, she urged instantly. Weird legends always fascinate me. Of course, I know just the outlines of its history. It's the tales told by the country folk in which I'm so deeply interested. You mean the apparition of the lady in green and all that? Yes, and the whispers. He started quickly at her words and asked, What do you know about them, dear? I hope you haven't heard them. She smiled with a frantic effort at unconcern, saying, And what harm, pray, would they have done to me even if I had? Well, he said, they are only heard by those whose days are numbered, at least so say the folk about here. Of course it's only a fable, she laughed. The people of the Oakheels are so very superstitious. I believe the fatal result of listening to those mysterious whispers has been proved in more than one instance remarked the young man quite seriously. For myself, I do not believe in any supernatural agency. I merely tell you what the people hereabouts believe. Nobody from this neighborhood could ever be induced to visit your ruins on a moonlit night. That's just why I want to know the origin of the unexplained phenomenon. How can I tell you? But you know. I mean, you've heard the legend, haven't you? Yes, was his reply. The story of the Whispers of Glencardine is well known all through Perthshire. Hasn't your father ever told you? He refuses. Because no doubt he fears that you might perhaps take it into your head to go there one night and try to listen for them, her lover said. Do not court misfortune, dearest. Take my advice and give the place a very wide berth. There is, without a doubt, some uncanny agency there. The girl laughed outright. I do declare, Walter that you believe in these foolish traditions, she said. Well, I'm a Scot, you see, darling, and a little superstition is perhaps permissible, especially in connection with such a mystery as the strange disappearance of Cardinal Satone. Then tell me the real story as you know it, she urged. I'm much interested. I only heard about the whispers quite recently. The historical facts, so far as I can recollect reading them in the book in question, he said, are to the effect that the most reverend James Cardinal Setun, Archbishop of St. Andrews, Chancellor of the Kingdom, was in the middle of the 16th century directing all his energies towards consolidating the Romish power in Scotland, and not hesitating to resort to any crime which seemed likely to accomplish his purpose. Many were the foul assassinations and terrible tortures upon innocent persons performed at his orders. One person who fell into the hands of this infamous cleric was Margaret, the second daughter of Charles Lord Glencardine, a beautiful girl of nineteen. Because she would not betray her, lover, she was so cruelly tortured in the cardinal's palace that she expired. After suffering fearful agony, and her body was sent back to Glencardine with an insulting message to her father, who at once swore to be avenged, the king had so far resigned the conduct of the kingdom into the hands of his eminence that nothing save armed force could oppose him. Satoon knew that a union between Henry the Eighth and James the Fifth would be followed by the downfall of the papal power in Scotland, and therefore he laid a skilful plot. Whilst advising James to resist the dictation of his uncle, he privately accused those of the Scottish nobles who had joined the reformers of meditated treason against his majesty. 
this placed the king in a serious dilemma for he could not proceed against henry without the assistance of those very nobles accused as traitors the wily cardinal had hoped that james would in self-defence seek an alliance with france and spain but he was mistaken you know of course how the forces of the kingdom were assembled and sent against the duke of norfolk the invader was thus repelled and the cardinal then endeavoured to organise a new expedition under romish leaders this also failing his eminence endeavoured to dictate to the country through the earl of arran the governor of scotland by a clever ruse he pretended friendship with erkskin of dun and endeavoured to use him for his own ends curiously enough over yonder and he pointed to a yellow parchment in a black ebony frame hanging upon the panelled wall of the hall over there is one of the cardinal's letters to erskine which shows the infamous cleric's smooth insinuating style when it suited his purpose i'll go and get it for you to read the young man rose and taking it down brought it to her she saw that the parchment about eight inches long by four wide was covered with writing in brown ink half faded while attached was a formidable oval red seal which bore a coat of arms surmounting the cardinal's hat with difficulty they made out the interesting letter to read as follows right honourable and traced cousing i commend me heartily to you not doubting but me lord governor he's written specially to you at this time to keep the diet with his lordship in edinburgh the first day of november next to come quilk i doubt not but ye will keep and i know perfectly well your good will and mind air inclined to serve my lord governor and how ye are not only determined to serve his lordship at this time be yourself but all's your great wise and solicitation made with money your great friends to do the same in quilk i assures ye shall come bathe to your air on air and the veil of you and your ouse and friends quilk you shall be sure i procure and fortify air at my power as i have shown in mare special my mind here until to your cousin of break and night praying you affectuously to keep triste and to be air in st andrews at me this next wednesday that we may depart altogether by thursday next to come toward my lord governor and bring your friends and servants with you accordingly and as my lord governor has special confidence in you at this time and be sure that pleasure i can do you shall be ever ready at my power as no is god qua preserve you eternal at st andrews on the twenty-fifth day of october fifteen forty four j cardinal off st andrews to the right honourable and our right trade cousin the laird dun most interesting declared the young girl holding the frame in her hands it's doubly interesting because it is believed that erskine's brother henry finding himself befooled by the crafty cardinal united with lord glencardine to kill him and dispose of his body secretly thus ridding scotland of one of her worst enemies walter went on for the past five years stories had been continually leaking out of setones in human cruelty his unscrupulous fiendish tortures inflicted upon all those who displeased him and how certain persons who stood in his way had died mysteriously or disappeared no one knew whither hence it was that at erskine's suggestions weymouth of strathblane went over to glencardine and with charles lord glencardine conspired to invite the cardinal there on pretence of taking counsel against the protestants but instead to take his life the conspirators were it is said joined by the earl of kentire and by mary the sixteen-year-old daughter of lord charles and sister of the poor girl so brutally done to death by his eminence on several successive nights the best means of getting rid of setones were considered and discussed and it is declared that the whispers now heard sometimes at glencardine are the secret deliberations of those sworn to kill the infamous cardinal mary the daughter of the house was allowed to decide in what manner her sister's death should be avenged and at her suggestion it was resolved that the inhuman head of the roman church should before his life was taken be put to the same fiendish tortures as those to which her sister had been subjected in his palace it is curious that after his crime the cardinal should dare to visit glencardine gabrielle remarked not exactly 
his lordship pretending that he wished to be appointed governor of scotland in the place of earl of arran had purposely made his peace with seton who on his part was only too anxious to again resume friendly relations with so powerful a noble therefore early in may fifteen forty six he went on a private visit and almost unattended to glencardine within the walls of which fortress he disappeared forever what exactly occurred will never be known all that the commission who subsequently sat to try the conspirators were able to discover was that the cardinal had been taken to the dungeon beneath the north tower and there tortured horribly for several days and afterwards burned at the stake in the courtyard the fire being ignited by lord glencardine himself and the dead cardinal's ashes afterwards scattered to the winds a terrible revenge exclaimed the girl with a shudder they were veritable fiends in those days they were he laughed rehanging the frame upon the wall some historians have of course declared that Satone was murdered at Maine's castle and others declare Cortaki to have been the scene of the assassination but the truth that it occurred at glencardine is proved by a quantity of the family papers which when your father purchased glencardine came into his possession you ought to search through them i will i had no idea dad possessed any of the glencardine papers she declared much interested in that story of the past perhaps from them i will be able to glean something further regarding the strange whispers of glencardine make whatever searches you like dearest he said in all earnestness but never attempt to investigate the whispers themselves and as they were alone he took her little hand in his and looking into her face with eyes of love pressed her to promise him never to disregard his warning she told him nothing of her own weird experience he was ignorant of the fact that she had actually heard the mysterious whispers and that as a consequence a great evil already lay upon her End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain follows flockhart's fortunes one evening a few days later gabrielle seated beside her father at his big writing-table had concluded reading some reports and had received those brief laconic replies which the blind man was in the habit of giving when she suddenly asked i believe dad that you have a quantity of the glencardine papers haven't you if i remember right when you bought the castle you made possession of these papers a stipulation yes dear i did was his answer i thought it a shame that the papers of such a historic family should be dispersed at sotheby's as they no doubt would have been so i purchased them you've never let me see them she said as you know you've taught me so much antiquarian knowledge that I'm becoming an enthusiast like yourself. You can see them, dear, of course, was his reply. They are in that big ebony cabinet at the end of the room yonder. About two hundred charters, letters, and documents, dating from 1314 down to 1695. I'll go through them tomorrow, she said. I suppose they throw a good deal of light upon the history of the Grahams and the actions of the great Lord Glencardine? Yes, but i fear you'll find them very difficult to read he remarked not being able to see them for myself alas i had to send them to london to be deciphered and you still have the translations unfortunately no dear professor petra at oxford who is preparing his great work on glencardine begged me to let him see them and he still has them well she laughed i must therefore content myself with the originals eh do they throw any further light upon the secret agreement in 1644 between the great Marquis of Glencardine, whose home was here, and King Charles? Really, Gabrielle, laughed the old antiquary, for a girl, your recollection of abstruse historical points is wonderful. Not at all. There was a mystery, I remember, and mysteries always attract me. Well, he replied after a few moments' hesitation, I fear you will not find the solution of that point or of any other really important point contained in any of the papers the most interesting records they contain are some relating to alexander since Stuart, the fourth son of robert the second 
who was granted in 1379 a castle of Garth. He was a reprobate, and known as the Wolf of Badenoch. On his father's accession in 1371, he was granted the charters of Badenoch, with the castle of Lochendorb and of Strathhaven, and at a slightly later date he was granted the lands of Tempar, Lassen to Loch, to Loch Krosk, and Garth. As you know, many traditions regarding him still survive, but one fact contained in yonder papers is always interesting, for it shows that he was confined in the dungeon of the old keep of Glencardine until Robert the Third released him. There was also a quantity of interesting facts regarding Red Neil or Neil Stewart of Fothergill, who was Laird of Garth, which will some day be of value to future historians of Scotland. Is there anything concerning the mysterious fate of Cardinal Satoon within Glencardine? asked the girl, unable to curb her curiosity. No, he replied in a manner which was almost snappish. There is a mere tradition, my dear, simply a tale invented by the country folk. It seems to have been imagined in order to associate it with the mysterious whispers which some superstitious people claim to have heard. No old castle is complete nowadays without its ghost. So we have for our share the lady of glencardine and the whispers he laughed but i thought it was a matter of authenticated history that the cardinal was actually enticed here and disappeared exclaimed the girl i should have thought that the glencardine papers would have referred to it she added recollecting what walter had told her well they don't so why worry your head dear over a mere fable i have already gone very carefully into all the facts that are proved and have come to the conclusion that the story of the torture of his eminence is a fairy tale, and that the supernatural whispers have only been heard in imagination. She was silent. She recollected the sound of murmuring voices. It was certainly not imagination. But you'll let me have the key of the cabinet, won't you, Dad? She asked, glancing across to where stood a beautiful old Florentine cabinet of ebony inlaid with ivory, and reaching almost to the ceiling certainly gabrielle dear was the reply of the expressionless man it is upstairs in my room you shall have it to-morrow and then he lapsed again into silence reflecting whether it were not best to secure certain parchment records from those drawers before his daughter investigated them there was a small roll of yellow parchment tied with modern tape which he was half inclined to conceal from her curious gaze truth to tell they constituted a record of the torture and death of Cardinal Setoun, much in the same manner as Walter Murray had described to her. If she read that strange chronicle, she might, he feared, be impelled to watch and endeavor to hear the fatal whispers. Strange though it was, yet those sounds were a subject which caused him daily apprehension, though he never referred to them save to ridicule every suggestion of their existence, or to attribute the weird noises to the wind and yet never a day passed that he sat calmly reflecting. The only matter which his daughter knew above all others caused him the most serious thought and apprehension, a fear which had become doubly increased, since she had referred to the curious and apparently inexplicable phenomenon. He, a refined, educated man of brilliant attainments, scouted the idea of any supernatural agency. To those who had made mention of the whispers, among them his friend murray the lord of conican lord strathaven from whom he had purchased the estate and several of the neighboring landowners he had always expressed a hope that one day he might be fortunate enough to hear the whispered counsel of the evil one and so decide for himself its true cause he pretended always to treat the affair with humorous incredulity yet at heart he was sorely troubled if his young wife's remarkable friendship with the man Flockhart often caused him bitter thoughts, then the mysterious whispers and the fatality so strangely connected with them were equally a source of constant inquietude. A few days later Flockhart, with his clever cunning, seemed to alter his ingenious tactics completely, for suddenly he had commenced to bestir himself in Sir Henry's interests. One morning after breakfast, taking the baronet by the arm, he led him for a stroll along the drive, down to the lodge gates, and back, for the purpose, as he explained, of speaking with him in confidence. At first the blind man was full of curiosity as to the reason of this unusual action, 
as those deprived of sight usually are i know sir henry flockhart said presently and not without hesitation that certain ill-disposed people have endeavoured to place an entirely wrong construction upon your wife's friendship towards me for that reason i have decided to leave glencardine both for her sake and for yours but my dear fellow exclaimed the blind man why do you suggest such a thing because your wife's enemies have made their mouths full of scandalous lies he replied i tell you frankly sir henry that my friendship with her ladyship is a purely platonic one we were children together at home in bedford and ever since our school days i have remained her friend i know that remarked the old man quietly my wife told me that when you dined with us on several occasions at park street i have never objected to the friendship existing between you flockhart for though i have never seen you i have always believed you to be a man of honour i feel very much gratified at those words sir henry he said in a deep earnest voice glancing at the grey dark spectacled face of the fragile man whose arm he was holding indeed i have always hoped that you would repose sufficient confidence in me to know that i am not such a blackguard as to take any advantage of your cruel affliction the blind baronet sighed oh my dear flockhart all men are not honourable like yourself there are many ready to take advantage of my lack of eyesight i have experienced it alas in business as well as in my private life the dark-faced man was silent he was playing an ingenious if dangerous game the baronet had referred to business his mysterious business the secret of which he was now trying his best to solve i suppose the standard of honesty in business is nowadays just about as low as it can possibly be eh well i've never been in business myself so i don't know in the one or two small financial deals in which i've had a share i've usually been frozen out in the end off lockhart sighed the laird of glencardine you are unfortunately quite correct the so-called smart business man is the one who robs his neighbor without committing the sin of being found out this remark caused the other a twinge of conscience did he intend to convey any hidden meaning he was full of cunning and cleverness well flockhart exclaimed i am truly gratified to think that i retain your confidence sir henry if i have in the past been able to be of any little service to lady hayburn i assure you i am only too delighted yet i think that in the face of gossip which some of your neighbours here are trying to spread gossip started i very much fear by miss gabrielle my absence from glencardine will be of distinct advantage to all concerned i do not my dear sir henry desire for one single moment to embarrass you or to place her ladyship in any false position i but my dear fellow you've become quite an institution with us exclaimed sir henry in dismay we should all be lost without you why as you know you've done me so many kindnesses that i can never sufficiently repay you i don't forget how through your advice i've been able to effect quite a number of economies at Castor, and how often you assisted my wife in various ways in her social duties my dear sir henry he laughed you know i'm always ready to serve either of you whenever it lies in my power only well i feel that i'm in your wife's company far too much both here and in lincolnshire people are talking therefore i have decided to leave her and my decision is irrevocable let them talk if i do not object you surely need not but for your wife's sake i know i know how cruel are people's tongues flockhart remarked the old man yes and the gossip was unfortunately started by gabrielle it was surely very unwise of her ah said the other it is the old story every girl becomes jealous of her stepmother and she's only a child after all he added apologetically well much as i esteem her and much as i admire her i feel sir henry that she had no right to bring discord into your house i hope you will permit me to say this with all due deference to the fact that she's your daughter but i consider her conduct in this matter has been very unfriendly again the baronet was silent and his companion saw that he was reflecting deeply how do you know that the scandal was started by her he asked presently in a low rather strained voice young patterson told me so it appears that when she was staying with them over at tully allen she told his mother all sorts of absurd stories 
and mrs patterson as you know is a terrible gossip told the reeds of logie and redcastles and in a few days those fictions with all sorts of embroidery were spread half over scotland why my friend lindsay the member for berwick heard some whispers the other day in the carlton club so in consequence of that sir henry i'm resolved much against my will and inclination i assure you to end my friendship with your wife all this pains me more than i can tell you declared the old man the more so too that gabrielle should have allowed her jealousy to lead her to make such false charges yes in order not to pain you i have hesitated to tell you this for several weeks but i really thought that you ought at least to know the truth and who originated the scandal and so i have ventured to-day to speak openly and to announce my departure said the wily flockart he was putting to the test the strength of his position in that household he had an ulterior motive one that was ingenious and subtle but you are not really going exclaimed the other you told me the other day something about my factor macdonald and your suspicions of certain irregularities my dear sir henry it will be far better for us both if i leave to remain will only be to lend further colour to these scandalous rumours i have decided to leave your house you believe that macdonald is dishonest eh inquired the afflicted man quickly yes i am certain of it remember sir henry that when one is dealing with a man who is blind it is sometimes a great temptation to be dishonest i know i know sighed the other deeply they were at a bend in the drive where the big trees met overhead forming a leafy tunnel the ascent was a trifle steep and the baronet had paused for a few seconds leaning heavily upon the arm of his friend oh pardon me exclaimed flockhart suddenly releasing his arm your watch chain is hanging down let me put it right for you and for a few seconds he fumbled at the chain at the same time holding something in the palm of his left hand there that's right he said a few minutes later you caught it somewhere i expect on one of the knobs of my writing-table perhaps said the other thanks i sometimes inadvertently pull it out of my pocket a faint smile of triumph passed across the dark handsome face of the man who again took his arm as at the same time he replaced something in his own jacket pocket he had in that instant secured what he wanted you were saying with much truth my dear flockhart that in dealing with a man who cannot see there is occasionally a temptation towards dishonesty well this very day i intend to have a long chat with my wife but before i do so will you promise me one thing and what is that asked the man not without some apprehension that you will remain here disregard the gossip that you may have heard and continue to assist me in my helplessness in making full and searching inquiry into macdonald's alleged defalcations the man reflected for a few seconds with knit brows his quick wits were instantly at work for he saw with the utmost satisfaction that he had been entirely successful in disarming all suspicion therefore his next move must be the defeat of that man's devoted defender gabrielle the one person who stood between his own penniless self and fortune i really cannot at this moment make any promise sir henry he remarked at last i have decided to go but defer your decision for the present there is surely no immediate hurry for your departure first let me consult my wife urged the baronet putting out his hand and groping for that of flockhart which he pressed warmly as proof of his continued esteem let me talk to winifred she shall decide whether you go or whether you shall stay End of chapter fifteen chapter number sixteen of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain shows a girl's bondage walter murray had chosen politics as a profession long ago even when he was an undergraduate he had already eaten his dinners in london and had been called to the bar as his first step towards a political career he had a relative in the foreign office while his uncle had held an under-secretaryship in the late government. Therefore, he had influence, and hoped by its aid to secure some safe seat. Already he had studied both home and foreign affairs very closely, and had on two occasions written articles in the Times upon that most vexed and difficult question. 
the pacification of macedonia he was a very fair speaker too and on several occasions he had seconded resolutions and made quite clever speeches at political gatherings in his own county perthshire indeed politics was his hobby and with money at his command and influence in high quarters there was no reason why he should not within the next few years gain a seat in the house with sir henry hayburn he often had long and serious chats the brilliant politician whose career had so suddenly and tragically been cut short gave him much good advice pointing out the special questions he should study in order to become an authority this is the age of specializing and in politics it is just as essential to be a specialist as it is in the medical legal or any other profession in a few days the young man was returning to his dingy chambers in the temple to pour again over those mouldy tomes of law therefore almost daily he ran over to glencardine to chat with the blind baronet and to have quiet walks with the sweet girl who looked so dainty in her fresh white frocks and whose warm kisses were so soft and caressing surely no pair even in the bygone days of knight and dame the days of real romance were more devoted to each other with satisfaction he saw that gabrielle's apparent indifference had now worn off it had been but the mask of a woman's whim and as such he treated it one afternoon after tea out on the lawn they were walking together by the by-path to the lodge in order to meet lady hayburn who had gone into the village to visit a bedridden old lady hand in hand they were strolling for on the morrow he was going south and would probably be absent for some months the girl had allowed herself to remain in her lover's arms in one long kiss of perfect ecstasy then with a sigh of regret she had held his hand and gone forward again without a word when walter had left the son of her young life would have set for after all it was not exactly exciting to be the eyes and ears of a man who was blind and there was always at her side that man whom she hated and who she knew was her bitterest foe james flockhart of late her father seemed to have taken him strangely into his confidence why she could not tell a sudden change of front on the baronet's part was unusual but as she watched with sinking heart she could not conceal from herself the fact that flockhart now exercised considerable influence over her father an influence which in some matters had already proved to be greater than her own it was of this man walter spoke i have a regret dearest nay more than a regret a fear in leaving you here alone he exclaimed in a low distinct voice gazing into the blue fathomless depths of those eyes so very dear to him a fear why she asked in some surprise returning his look because of that man your mother's friend he said recently have heard some curious tales concerning him i really wonder why sir henry still retains him as his guest why need we speak of him she exclaimed quickly for the subject was distasteful because i wish you to be forewarned he said in a serious voice that man is no fitting companion for you his past is too well known to a certain circle his past she echoed what have you discovered concerning him her companion did not answer for a few moments how could he tell her all that he had heard his desire was to warn her yet he could not relate to her the allegations made by certain persons against flockhart gabrielle he said all that i have heard tends to show that his friendship for you and for your father is false therefore avoid him beware of him i i know she faltered lowering her eyes i felt that was the case all along yet i yet what he asked i mean i want you to promise me one thing walter she said quickly you love me do you not love you my own darling how can you ask such a question you surely know that i do then if you really love me you will make me a promise of what only one thing one little thing she said in a low earnest voice looking straight into his eyes if if that man ever makes an allegation against me you won't believe him an allegation why darling what allegation could such a man ever make against you he is my enemy she remarked simply i know that but what charge could he bring against you why if he even dared to utter a single word against you i i'd wring the ruffian's neck 
But if he did, Walter, you wouldn't believe him, would you? Of course I wouldn't. Not, not if the charge he made against me was a terrible one? A, a disgraceful one? She asked in a strained voice after a brief and painful pause. Why, dearest, he cried, what is the matter? You are really not yourself today. You seem to be filled with a graver apprehension even than I am. What does it mean? Tell me. It means, Walter, that the man is Lady Hayburn's friend, hence he is my enemy. And what need you fear when you have me as your friend? I do not fear if you will still remain my friend, always, in face of any allegation he makes. I love you, darling. Surely that's sufficient guarantee of my friendship. Yes, she responded, raising her white troubled face to his, while he bent and kissed her again on the lips. I know that I am yours, my own well-beloved, as, and as yours, I will not fear. That's right, he exclaimed, endeavoring to smile. Cheer up. I don't like to see you on this last day downhearted and apprehensive like this. I am not so without cause. Then what is the cause? he demanded. Surely you can repose confidence in me. Again she was silent. Above them the wind stirred the leaves, and through the high bracken a rabbit scuttled at their feet. They were alone, and she stood again locked in her lover's fond embrace. You have told me yourself that man Flockhart is my enemy, she said in a low voice. But what action of his can you fear? Surely you should be forearmed against any evil he may be plotting. Tell me the truth, and I will go myself to your father and denounce the fellow before his face. Ah, oh, no, she cried, full of quick apprehension. Never think of doing that, Walter. Why, am I not your friend? Such a course would only bring his wrath down upon my head. He would retaliate quickly, and I alone would suffer. But, my dear Gabrielle, he exclaimed, you really speak in enigmas. Whatever can you fear from a man who is known to be a blackguard, whom I could now, at this very moment, expose in such a manner that he would never dare to set foot in Perthshire again? Such a course would be most injudicious, I assure you. His ruin would mean, it would mean my own. I don't follow you. Ah, because you do not know my secret, you— Your secret? The young man gasped, staring at her, yet still holding her trembling form in his strong arms. Why, what do you mean? What secret? I, I cannot tell you, she exclaimed in a hard mechanical voice, looking straight before her. But you must, he protested. I, I asked you, Walter, to make me a promise, she said, her voice broken by emotion. A promise that for the sake of the love you bear for me you will not believe that man that you will disregard any allegation against me and i promise on one condition darling that you tell me in confidence what i as your future husband have a just right to know the nature of this secret of yours ah oh, no she cried unable longer to restrain her tears and burying her pale beautiful face upon his arm i, I was foolish to have spoken of it she sobbed brokenly I ought to have kept it to myself. It is, it's the one thing I can never reveal to you. To you of all men. End of chapter 16